Hello and welcome to this Better Business Bureau webinar, Building Trust in Trying Times. Today, it is all about the SBA, PPP, and Idle Loan Program, specifically an update on where we stand with those as now round two of funding has taken place at the recording of this. And uh, the SBA has ran into some challenges according to the news of, as of late on processing the rush of applications that have hit. Plus we'll talk about the importance of, of record keeping uh, so that you are able as a business owner, able to turn that loan into a grant. We're also working to make this webinar as interactive as possible. We have a poll that we're going to ask a question right now as we do a little bit of housekeeping and prepare to introduce today's speaker. We're going to ask you uh, where your, what your status is if you've applied uh, for one of the PPP or EIDL loans that is up on the polling questions up on the screen right now. If you would go ahead and answer that question, we would really appreciate it. We're going to be also taking questions for our presenter at the end of this webinar. So if you have a question or a question comes up that you're looking for clarification, please look for that Q&A box at the uh, lower end of your Zoom screen. Use that to submit questions. It makes it uh, really easy so that we're able to go through and methodically answer the questions uh, throughout the course at the end of this webinar. Terry Frisk is our guest today, back for a second time for a webinar because of how popular he was and the value, valuable information that he gave us during that first webinar almost a month ago now, Terry, hard to believe, but Terry has more than 25 years of business experience as a general manager, controller, and chief financial officer. He is a CPA whose career has been focused on small to medium-sized privately held companies. His extensive background and experience have given him the skills to assist in many different aspects of a business's financial needs. Uh, also, he has helped companies manage growth, forecast cash flow, increase margins, reduce employee benefit costs without uh, compromising key components, improving their banking relationships, and obtaining favorable pricing and terms from vendors. All of those things, very, very important, especially during these times. He is an expert at strategic and long-term planning, tax planning and projections, budgeting and forecasting, systems implementation, staff training and development. Terry, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, and, and we'll start off, uh, you can see where, where folks are at. About 51% of our respondents have applied and, and have received funding. About 33% have applied but have not received funding and about 16% have not applied. And actually we do have some great information coming up in today's webinar for those that have not applied and might be looking for some other options. So Terry, what's, uh, what's the latest uh, as far as the information and, and news that you're tracking when it comes to SBA, the PPP and the EIDL loans? Well, thanks for having me back, Dale. First, uh, first off, and I want to welcome everyone to the to this session. Uh, you know, the latest in, in the PPP loans is they've they've uh, restarted uh, accepting applications right, with the SBA on Monday, but it's been a rocky start. The the, the system crashed early on uh, because of the sheer volume. A lot of the banks had uh, applications in the queue, and so um, they were you know madly putting in the applications and um, it, it just overwhelmed the system. And, and so they've had problems uh, getting going on the second round, uh, but you know, they overcame the same type of problems first round. So uh, I anticipate it'll, it'll get started back up. I haven't seen any numbers yet on, on those types of, um, on the applications on that, on the second round. So, um, now, I, I, I want to start with a, with a recap uh, of, of the PPP program. Now, the SBA started taking applications initially on, on April 3rd and approved a total of uh, 1,661,000 loans. Uh, let's see. Make sure I'm there. Uh, as the table shows, it, it was an um, unbelievable amount of volume. And while there's been a lot of media attention on the on the four percent of the loans, uh, over a million that, that consumed uh, forty five percent of the dollars, uh, there were almost one point six million loans under a million, with an overall average loan size of two hundred six thousand. So doing the math, 
you know, that would translate into an average monthly payroll of about 82,000. And so with the, the average monthly wage in the U.S., about $4,000, the um, average business size for the loans granted is around 20 employees. So uh, it's largely achieved what, what Congress has set out to do is, is to assist the smaller businesses. Well, there's been a number that, uh, that of large businesses that, that, that went through uh, a large percentage of the dollars has gone to the the small businesses and with the second round coming up, uh, hopefully uh, we can get another um, 30 or 40 percent funded um, because as a, as a poll indicated, uh, about three fourths of the small businesses submitted an application but only uh, 20 percent were funded and, and looking at the results for, uh, from this group of 51 percent received funding, uh, you're well ahead of the curve. But um, and if you've got your application in, uh, I recommend you be persistent with your banker to, to, to push the application through. Uh, be the squeaky wheel and um, um, be in touch, be, be in contact with them to, to uh, usher that application through the, the process to make sure you get uh, uh, funding in this, in this second round. But if you're not successful, uh, in security of PPV loan, there are other relief options available. I mean, first, you can apply for an SBA 7A loan, which, like a PPP loan, is available through your bank, but the terms aren't quite as favorable as for a PPP loan. But you can borrow with a 10 year payment term and an approximately 4% interest rate, you know, depending upon the, uh, uh, what the bank is, is charging. Uh, next, there's the um, employee retention tax credit that allows employers to take a 50% credit on wages that are paid between March 12, 2020 and January 1, 2021. So to qualify, uh, the business must either suspend operations due to, to a governmental order or experience a 50% decline in revenues from the corresponding quarter of the prior year. So in some cases, this, this may be even more advantageous than, than a PPP loan, because uh, it, it could amount to more, because you're comparing, uh, you're getting credit for essentially two and a half months worth of payroll under a PPP loan, whereas in, in this, um, in the uh, employee retention tax credit, uh, you'll get a 50% credit for payroll over nine and a half months, uh, conceivably. Then uh, businesses can defer payment of the employer portion of social security taxes between March 12th and January 1st, 2021. Uh, this will keep 6.2% of your gross payroll in your pocket. You know, until it's due, which is in two installments, 50% uh, due December 31st, 21, and 50% due December 31st of 22. So uh, if you have, say, a million dollar payroll, uh, you could keep $62,000, uh, not have to make that payroll tax deposit, and then it'd be an interest-free loan that's payable over, over two years. And if you have a PPP loan, you can still defer up to the time the loan is forgiven. So. Uh, you know, you can take advantage of that now, even if you have a PPP loan up until the time it's, it's forgiven. Now there's a myriad of state and local assistance programs that, that may be available to you. The best source of information I found is um, on the uh, Intuit QuickBooks website. And Jason, if you can post the, um, the link to the website, uh, go to that website and it'll list uh, and a number of programs are available, uh, not only nationally, but in your particular uh, state. You know, also, there's a, a number of private funding programs listed on the uh, QuickBooks site. So check out these options. Uh, some may be viable for you. Now, for those of you who have received the PPP funding, you know, I want to talk about next steps. So before you blow through all the cash, uh, you should consider how the funds are going to be spent to be in compliance 
with the program requirements. Now, in the in the interim final rule that was issued on on April second, the SBA stated at least seventy five percent of the PPP loan proceeds shall be used for payroll costs. Then they want further to say, this limitation on use of the loan funds will help ensure that the finite appropriations available for these loans are directed toward payroll protection as each loan that is issued depletes the appropriation regardless of whether portions of the loan are later forgiven. Now there's been a lot of confusion on this topic uh, because a lot of the attention is focused on the on the forgiveness piece, and this is actually uh, written into the the section of the the uh, of the um, rules that um, apply to the forgiveness. So I think I think it's created quite a bit of confusion. Although the the wording seems pretty clear that 75% uh, of the loan amount is to be spent on on uh, payroll. Now, to date, the, the SBA has been issuing guidance on loan eligibility and has not provided a lot of guidance on administration. So they, they may come back and state that the 75% relates only to the forgiveness piece and that the June 30th measurement date relates only to the, to the headcount and, and wage rules that I'll cover here in a minute. But I don't believe you'll be able to use the uh, proceeds for, for other purposes in anticipation of converting to a, a two-year low interest loan. I mean, this is um, underscores the importance of planning and how the proceeds will be used. And especially if you're in a business that can't reopen until June or later, you know, we're just gonna have to see what kind of guidance the, the SBA provides uh, on, on this application. So looking next at the, at the forgiveness rules, you know, the guidelines are clear that no more than 25% of the, of the forgivable amount can be used for non, or non payroll expenses, which includes rent, interest, uh, mortgage that has been in place as of February 15th and, and utilities. So if you're able to spend 75% of the total loan amount on payroll costs and 25% on eligible costs during the eight week, eight week period, then the full amount of loan may be forgiven. However, the forgiveness will be reduced if the number of full-time equivalents during eight week period is less than the base period. Now the base period is your choice between February 15th of 2019 through June 30th of 2019, or January 1st of 2020 and February 29th of 2020. So what you need to do is calculate the number of FTEs for both periods and select the lower period. Now the guidance has yet uh, been issued that defines an FTE, but other governmental rules generally define it as 30 hours per week. So you take the number of employees, uh, divide it by 30, although you got to throw out uh, the hours that uh, employees have above 30 in order to calculate the number of, of FTEs. But this will provide you a basis for planning how many FTEs you will need to employ during the eight week period. Now, there's a safe harbor rule that this deficiency can be cured by restoring the number of FTEs by June 30th. So theoretically, I mean, the way this is written, um, you could actually hire the employees back on June 30th and then turn around and lay them back off July 1st and meet this rule. I don't think that's what the SBA's intent is. So you know, I look for them to issue further guidance on this uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, the next is the um, individual employee rule, which is uh, which states that forgiveness will be reduced if wages for individual employees during the eight week period are more than 25% below the amount for that employee for the previous quarter. So it's on an employee by employee basis. You got to look at the individual employees 
but you throw out the employees that are over 100,000. You, you don't have to consider those. Um, the problem is, this is going to require a little more guidance on how to compare wages for the eight week period to the amount during the quarter, which is actually 13 weeks. I mean, it, the SBA has not issued any guidance on that yet. But um, there is also the ability to cure any deficiency by restoring the reduction in wages uh, to the February 15th level by June 30th. Again, you know, much like the headcount rule. But as uh, Darren Leon pointed out in his presentation last Thursday, I mean, the 75% payroll cost rule will likely make the, the wage and headcount rule irrelevant because you're gonna need to bring back uh, all the employees and reach full employment to, to achieve that um, level of the 75%. So plan accordingly. You know, put together a plan, uh, calculate out where you need to be, and um, see how that fits with uh, your ability to, to uh, bring these employees back. Okay, next I want to look at um, the forgiveness rules. You will need to apply to the bank at the end of, you know, after the end of, of June. And so the bank is gonna to want to determine to substantiate the calculations you made in, in how the, the, the PPP funds were spent. So I recommend keeping the PPP funds segregated in a separate bank account and issue funds from this account only for eligible expenses. You know, and this provides discipline over the use of the funds plus maintains a running balance on how much funds are remaining. Now the process I've set up for my clients um, is to create a, a spreadsheet that details details the the expenses, both payroll costs and other eligible expenses, um, and update it on a weekly basis. And I, of course, uh, attending a, a, a webinar put on by a CPA, you, you knew you were gonna see a spreadsheet at some point. So uh, here it is, I promise this is the only spreadsheet, but as, as you can see, I've laid it out with, uh, with the uh, rows for the individual uh, qualifying expenses and columns that segregate out between payroll and other eligible expenses. And then note at the bottom, uh, I keep hey, running. Barry, I'm gonna interrupt real quick because we cannot see the spreadsheet that you're showing, so. One more click. There yeah. we go, thank you. Thanks, Dale, sorry. So it's, it's backing up, as you can see, um, the, um, I've listed out the, the expenses on the left and then have separate columns for payroll costs and other eligible costs. Uh, maintain this on, on a weekly basis or whatever basis fits your, your business, maybe, maybe on a payroll cycle would would be easier. And then you come down to the bottom and it calculates a running total of the amount of remaining PPP funds you have available. And then you can use this total uh, if, if you're uh, paying expenses out of your regular bank account, you can use this total to transfer funds from your PPP account to uh, the operating account so you have documentation of, of how the, the funds, the amounts were calculated and how they were, they were applied. Also, I recommend scanning copies of um, the expense documents like your payroll register totals and eligible expense bills and saving them to a folder so that you'll have all the necessary documentation when it comes time to, to apply for forgiveness. Okay, now I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, to a, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk a little about reopening your business. Some businesses um, were able to continue to operate through the shelter and place orders while others had completely shut down. 
Now, the states are starting to ease up on restrictions. Uh, you need to be planning your strategy on how you're going to reopen your business. So first, start planning on how you're going to uh, return employees back to work. You know, obviously, you're going to want to be working toward that 75% rule, but also um, what, what it's going to take to, to bring them back. Because bear in mind, um, if, if they've been off and drawing unemployment, the uh, supplemental unemployment amount is $600 in, in addition to their regular weekly unemployment amount. So they could conceivably be making more than um, what they were making while they were at work. So you may need to look for replacements. You know, also consider um, whether you should have them tested before returning to work and what steps you're going to take to ensure that they will not get infected on the job. Uh, locally, there's a, a medical facility that's, that's doing return to work testing. So uh, if there's those types of, of uh, resources available, uh, consider that because you know, you're going to want to be able to advertise that Yes, our employees have been tested, or they're, they're uh, cleaned, and so it's a, a safe environment for customers to return. Uh, also, evaluate what changes need to be made to the, the workplace to, to meet any continuing regulations and ensure safety to both employees and, and customers. So what, what needs to be done? If you're in a restaurant, do you, you need to um, segregate tables, move, move them a little further apart, uh, or if you're in some like retail operation, if there needs to be a shield in front of cashiers, the, those type of changes that, that need to be made to, to the workplace uh, to, to make it safe for both customers and employees. Anticipate changes in uh, customer behavior. Customers may be skittish at first, or if you're a B2B business, your, your customer may not reopen when you are ready. So also be aware of any remaining restrictions on the way your business operates. Uh, you know, each individual state and locality are, are gonna have individual uh, regs on, on reopening the business. So be cognizant of those and, and, and plan accordingly. You know, similarly with your vendors, be aware of their reopening plans and how that will impact your business. Um, they may not even reopen, so you may need to find an alternative source for their product or service. And it's a good time to revisit your, your business model. Uh, your business landscape may have changed dramatically, so you need to pivot in order to remain relevant in this post-coronavirus world. And then finally, have a contingency plan in the event there is a second wave of infections that uh, results in reestablishing the um, shelter in place rules. So in summary, uh, plan use of the PP funds to maximize the potential forgiveness Watch for additional guidelines from the SBA and adjust your plans accordingly. Use documentation techniques to, to use the, uh, the PPP funds. Check into other as assistance programs. Um, check out the um, Intuit site or, or even Google uh, other types of, of resources that may be available to you. Uh, work on developing a reopening plan. And finally, take care and stay healthy. <laughs> so with that, Dale, I'm hoping for questions. Absolutely. And we have the questions starting to stack up. So we're going to dive right in, Terry. And uh, the first question, when we signed up to get the SBA PPP funds, they only figured our payroll times two and a half. That doesn't leave much for expenses. Is there something we can do to get more funds to help? Uh, well, it, it, the, the initial calculation was two and a half times your monthly average 
wages. So it's essentially equals two and a half months. But the, the measurement period for forgiveness is going to be eight weeks. So, um, but I, if I'm interpreting your, your question uh, uh, correctly, you're looking for other additional funds beyond or resources beyond the the end of the PPP program. And like I say, check out the um, the Intuit site. Uh, also, you know, SBA uh, 7A loans are, are still going to be available uh, for working capital needs, uh, albeit that you know they, they won't they can't be turned into a grant, but they um, are available for um, working capital with with pretty um, uh, pretty generous terms. Okay. Next question. I'm in the care management service to elders business with the governor's plan to reopen gradually and care facilities projected not to reopen to visitors, non-essential until mid-June. Do you have suggestions for keeping my billable hours steady? Uh, you know, that's going to be tough in some of those industries. Uh, things you can do uh, would be training for employees, um, providing any additional training any additional uh, tasks that, uh, that they may be able to do. Uh, but uh, in terms of, of billable, I, I don't know if any of that could be billable. You know, you're in a tough situation and, uh, you know, pivot to, to what you can do uh, in, in terms of uh, working with your current clients and, and trying to keep the billable hours up. Okay. Next question. We received our PPP loan in the middle of the pay period. Can we use it for all of this pay period or do we, or do we need to wait until the next pay period? Yeah, that's, that, that's a standard question. I, I, I think is the uh, SBA is going to have to provide uh, additional guidance on uh, because the, the, the term they, they use are um, cost paid or, or cost paid and incurred. So that could be either both on the cash basis, so when it's paid plus when it's incurred, or it could be or. It could be uh, when paid uh, or when it's incurred. So we're, we're looking for additional guidance from the SBA on, on, on this question, which hopefully will come in the, in the next few weeks. Um, the way I've been uh, treating it for my clients is uh, if it were paid uh, within that eight weeks, uh, then it counts toward the, the uh, forgiveness. Okay. Next question. Can we use the PPP for the expense gas mileage phone and internet for the owner of our company? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, they're, they're valid expenses for the company. So if, if the company's been paying these expenses, they could continue to pay them. And, uh, that, that brings up an, a, you know, a, a, an interesting question in, in terms of, uh, the SBA's defined, uh, utilities, uh, one items transportation. And I'm, I'm assuming that is gasoline for, um, operating the vehicles. Okay. If I only have 75% of FTEs full-time equivalent as compared to last year, does that mean I will get 75% forgiveness of the PPP loan? Well, we're looking for, uh, again, we're looking for additional guidance on that. Um, I mean, there, there is the one safe harbor in that if, if the, um, number of employees at the headcount is brought back up to the full amount uh, as of, you know, compared to the February 15th date by June 30th, then that uh, the headcount rule uh, does not apply. But again, we're looking for more guidance uh, because as it's written, you only have to bring that FTE count up for one day. And I doubt that that's going to uh, continue. I mean, I doubt that that's going to be the uh, determining rule. Okay. The next question comes from Kim. 
regarding an S core for owner's salary, what is the maximum they can receive if the normal annualized wage is under a hundred thousand? Is it 75% of first quarter wages or some percentage of 2019 wages? What if received raise, what if they, the person received a, a raise in January of 2020? Well, if you submitted your application based on 2019 and the, the owner, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the owner is on the payroll. If the owner is, is not on the payroll, then they're treated as an independent contractor. At least that's the way I'm interpreting the rules. There, there's uh, the rules in, in the Internal Revenue Code that talk about um, guaranteed payments to, to owners in LLCs and, and S Corps. And those are really treated as a distribution, although it's not been clear as to uh, whether they're gonna be included because they're actually they're payments for services. So if the owner is a on the payroll, uh, it will still count toward the the uh, loan application amount and the the forgiveness amount. But if the owner is um, receiving guaranteed payments, which would indicate that they're an independent contractor, uh, then my interpretation is uh, no; those amounts will not count. If my utilities, if my utility costs are less than 25% of the loan, can I use payroll as more than 75% of the loan money? Yes. Yes, it's, it's, it's just that those utility and rent costs cannot exceed 25%, but they can certainly be less. So if your payroll um, exceeds the, the 75%, then, then you're golden. You're good to go. Okay. This is outside of our area, especially from, from a CPA perspective. Um, and we might be able to answer this better on a webinar tomorrow about reopening a business. Uh, but Alina asks, does a medium risk company have to provide PPE equipment to the employee? Yeah, that's re really outside. Uh, my that's outside of our... So I'm going to ask Alina and anybody else who wants, we're going to focus on reopening a business tomorrow. And uh, this will be one of those questions that we should have a lot better read on tomorrow with the expertise present. So uh, Alina also asks, we're an essential company and my employees are refusing to go on jobs or come back to work. What should we do? We did receive the PPP money. Um, you know, some of that's going to depend upon uh, what your state's unemployment rules are. Uh, if, you, if you recall them and they don't come back, then they won't be eligible for, for um, unemployment going forward. At least, at least that's a rule in this state. Now, what complicates that is whether they're uh, stating that they don't feel safe coming back. It's, it's too early to come back. And that, that's what really complicates it. Now, in terms of measurement for the, for the PPP, uh, you can go out and replace them. You can um, hire um, additional employees uh, in their place. And it's my belief that, they, that uh, you can substitute them in, in some of these other um, measurements. So if, if you're looking to measure the, the head count, or the, the wage count, you, you'll be able to substitute uh, new employees for, for employees who did not come back. Okay. Helene asks, s -Corp sh uh, shareholders get wages and distributions. Are they allowed both from PPP or only actual W-2 wages? Only W-2 wages. I mean, if they're distributions, then, then they're not income. And like I mentioned before, there's there's this a rule about uh, guaranteed payments. Uh, that's kind of a hybrid between wages and distributions. And it's, it's my interpretation. And again, I think there'll be more guidance on this, but I believe they're gonna be treated as distributions and not uh, eligible cost. Please explain the $10,000 idle received after the PPP loan was received. Can they simply reduce the PPP loan by $10,000? 
never use that portion of funds and pay it back to not have to lose forgiveness on ten thousand dollars and i i believe that um it is calculated in in the end it's it's uh, um when the, at the time of forgiveness the the, the ten thousand is is applied at that point uh, because there's there, there's not that conduit between the 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 idle the disbursement of the idle loans and the and the PPP loans because the idle loans are are um, administered by the SBA and the PPP are administered by your, your local bank. Our equipment loans, uh, excuse me, our equipment leases included as rent. Uh, you know they could be. They could be. A, I think uh, Darren mentioned uh, Thursday talking about a copier uh, as being uh, potentially a, a utility item. So it, it kind of depends upon what the what the equipment is. I mean, the, the, the code itself really talks about uh, the rent being for the for the occupancy for the building. But okay. it, it could the the equipment could be classified as a potential utility item. Please clarify the transportation utility. Any contractor with trucks needing fuel, do these job specific trucks qualify even if they just stop by a local uh, BP to purchase the fuel? Uh, yes, the fuel, the fuel counts. Fuel that's counts. My, that's my interpretation because it, you know, it's, it's energy. It's like natural gas and electricity. So, uh, it, it's my interpretation is it's, it counts as uh, the utility cost. Can they still pay and have forgiven interest paid on non mortgage debts in place of 215? And no, it has to be mortgage debt. At least that's, um, the, the, the current consensus. Okay. If I have to fly to different job sites, would this be covered under the transportation and be forgivable? Uh, that's that, that's great. I would I would wait for a different uh, guidance on that uh, if it comes out. I mean, if if there's no specific guidance that, that it comes out on on transportation to job sites. Um, it's certainly a gray area that, that uh, I, I would include in, in, in documenting your, your application for forgiveness. So, um, I mean, worst that can happen is they, they, they would throw it out. But for, for most intents and purposes, they, um, the utilities, the standard utilities plus uh, rent will typically use that 25%. So you're really going to have to be stretching to, to have to include other ancillary items. Uh, business couldn't afford to pay the March rent and utilities or the owner's payroll. Can they use the PPP funds to pay those expenses they were unable to pay until they got the funds? Um, well, if it, again, it's, it's payments made. So if the payment was made within the eight week period after the the funds were dispersed. Uh, currently, it, it appears that, that that would count even though it's for a earlier period. But again, um, there needs to be more guidance on, on what the intent is in, in, that, uh, in that statement. So, Terry, because the information on this is, is coming out so rapidly, um, is the SBA keeping its website updated with new interpretations of these rules? Is there a place that, yes. that people should be looking? Yes, if, if, if you go to the um, SBA website, let's see if I have it here. Um, It's the home.treasury.gov policy dash issues cares assistance for small businesses. And the um, program rules are um, 
Oh, you can see where they're updated. Yes. Perfect. So, in fact, um, in fact, I see I see a new one issued today. The interim final rule on uh, seasonal empl employers. Okay. So this is a great place to go, and then um, we will also get the link for that web page and put it in the chat section of of, uh, of chat. So um, Helene and Alina have been asking some amazing questions. We want to give uh, some other folks an opportunity to get some questions in. So I'm going to skip down um, to, uh, let's see, if you have already received a PPP loan, is the employee retention credit also available or is it an either or? It's an either or. Okay. You, you, you can apply for the, the employee uh, retention if you have a PPP loan. Now, the, the, the other one, the Social Security deferral, uh, you can defer the, the employer portion of Social Security uh, until the, the time of forgiveness of the, um, the uh, PPP loan. Uh, let's see, will there be an application form for the forgiveness of loan or will that be up to the lender? That'll be up to the lender. And I believe that the uh, SBA is coming up with a, a kind of a standardized form, but it's, it's really going to be up to the lender what, what additional requirements they're going to have in terms of documentation and application. Okay, I'm going to answer this one really quick because it's come up in past webinars. Marianne asks, are copier leases considered a utility expense? Uh, both Terry has, has answered that and Darren on our last webinar answered that as a yes. Um, what happens if the services do not start until after July 1st, 2020? How do I spend money on payroll if the work is not in, available for the employee? Um, you know, you, un, uh, unfortunately, the PPP cuts off on June 30th. And unless um, there are modifications made, uh, you know, kind of out of luck. Now, that said, you know, there's, there's a high possibility that the, um, the rules might be modified to, to extend some of these dates. Uh, like I said, you know, a lot of businesses are two weeks into the eight week period and the SBA really hasn't uh, issued a lot of guidelines on the, the actual administration. So I, th I think the SBA is gonna be a, a little more lenient uh, in issuing guidelines and there may be extensions of, of dates in the future. We just don't know yet. Terry, would you be willing to share that Excel spreadsheet that you shared as, as an example on how to document expenses? Uh, yes. Would you be willing for, uh, for us to send that file via email to our participants? Oh, absolutely. Okay, that'd be fantastic. So uh, that was... Uh, one of the questions from Trina, what are considered transportation costs? Um, you know, like, like I said, I, th I think it's going to be fuel. Um, those types of things, like it's, it's energy related. You, you, you think of a utility as electricity, natural gas. So it, it's going to be the fuel, the, the gasoline or, or other fuel for, for vehicles. Okay. We operate a moving company. Can fuel for our trucks be used under the utilities loan money? Yes. And can you confirm telephone, water, sewer, and trash are included in the allowed utility expenses? It was our understanding they were not. So this is another one of those areas where there is some confusion. Uh, yes. I mean, they're all public utilities. So yes, they would be considered... Um, under the um, other eligible expenses. Okay. Scott Cameron is asking, how do we apply for an SBA idle loan? Well, currently the, the SBA is not taking any further idle loans. They're, they're, their backlog is, is too long at, the, at this point. So they're not taking any additional idle loans at this point. Uh, that may reopen uh, in the future. Leanne asks, what about pay frequencies that exceed the eight weeks, biweekly, monthly, um, 
as an example, a start date due to PPP funding may limit two month reporting, uh, semi monthly receive funding on the fourth, the fifth payroll already processed, only able to process three payrolls versus four before the eighth week deadline. Yeah, that's going to be uh, some of the complexities that the SBA is going to have to address in terms of their uh, how they apply the uh, um, the rules in terms of when these amounts are incurred and when they're paid. Um, I think there, you know, to, to be consistent, it's, it's, it's probably gonna have to go to a, to a, say an accrual basis, um, where it's based on uh, the, the amounts incurred during the, the eight weeks. Uh, otherwise businesses that have more frequent um, payrolls uh, would be able to claim more than, than businesses that do not. So, you know, look for guidance in the, in the coming weeks. And uh, I mean, if, if, if they take a, a liberal ruling and say it's, it's cash basis based on when the amount's paid, you know, maybe at the end of the eight week period, you do a special payroll to make sure it gets in under the wire. Let's see. How is the employer credited for the 50% employee retention credit? Are there limitations? As it's, you can apply to the IRS for a, an advanced credit. So it's, um, they, they would make a, a payment uh, to the company based on the, the estimate of the advanced credit. It's gonna be tracked through the quarterly um, employer return, the qu quarterly form 9041 um, payroll tax returns. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's much like the um, uh, advanced earned income credit. Uh, you, you put in for it early and then and receive the funds um, separately from the, from the time that um, you actually file the returns. Let's see, Karen writes, I missed the first half. Is payroll allow an allowable expense including social security and Medicare employer tax portions? Uh, just the employee portion. Gross wages uh, does not include uh, the, the employer portion of, of FICA or FUTA taxes, but you can include the um, state unemployment taxes and any other uh, local taxes that you may have in your jurisdiction. In the rules for forgiveness for the PPP monies, it says that federal taxes are not forgiven. Are federal taxes the employer's match social security and Medicare expenses, or does it include the employees withholdings as well? I'm not pre-reading these. And so it's in the same vein as the last question. Yeah, I mean, the early guidance uh, indicated that, that uh, the employee portion of federal withholding uh, was not included. And then uh, the SBA came back in, in later guidance and said, no, no, we, we only intended to, to exclude the, the FICA, the employer portion of FICA, did the FICA matching and the employer portion of FUTA. So the employee portion of, of FICA and federal taxes are included as uh, gross income. They're not excluded. As, as they originally were. And I know there was a lot of confusion, a lot of banks that uh, were uh, requiring the, the applicants to remove the, the uh, employee portion uh, from the application. And unfortunately, they, you know, a number of them got uh, processed that way so that the, uh, the, the later guidance that came out that was, you know, weren't able to be applied to those previous returns and the um, SBA is not accepting uh, additional uh, applications uh, for that difference in amount. If we incur expenses paid on a credit card for vehicle gas, can we use the, the loan to pay the credit card only for the amount charged for gas? Also auto payment for phone and internet is on credit cards. So can we use the, uh, can we use the loan amount to pay for the, pay those, those items on the credit card bill. 
Yes. Yes. Uh, charges on a credit card are, are treated just the same way as, as writing a check. Uh, you just want to be careful that you don't use the PPP funds to pay the full amount of the credit card. You only want to pay that portion that, that uh, related to the allowable expenses. And again, document what you're doing. Greg asks, do we need to count part-time employees that have fewer than 30 hours? Yes. Yes. You aggregate the hours of those people and then divide by 30 to determine the full-time equivalents. So if, if you have uh, three employees that are working 20 hours a week, they actually um, calculate out to be two full-time equivalents, right? Because there's three employees at 20 hours or 60 hours and divide by 30 and that's, that's two full-time equivalents. Okay. Are COVID hours to be included with PPP funded payroll? Uh, no, they, they cannot be included. Uh, you get a, a separate tax credit uh, at the end of the year uh, for amounts paid for the, the uh, COVID leave, the COVID mandated leave. Okay. Are eligible expenses paid out during the two month period? Uh, example, March paid electricity I'm trying to read through this. So I think the, the question is, uh, I paid my February power bill in March. Is that eligible under the rules? Yeah, we just, we just don't know go without additional guidance. I mean, I'm, I'm taking the stand, I'm uh, tracking those expenses because they were paid within the eight week period even though they related to an earlier period. And I'm looking the, for guidance to come out probably in the next couple of weeks on how that will be treated. So, you know, track it. And then um, when the additional guidance comes out, you may need to adjust it or may not, you know, hopefully. That, that's hopefully, a case of expense incurred versus expense paid. Right. And where does it fall? Uh, let's see. How soon do we need to bring the head count up to the previous count? By June 30th. June okay. 30th is a cutoff date for the head count rule. And it's, it's compared to the February 15th date. So if that's, that's the safe harbor. If you bring the head count up to the February 15th rate right by June 30th, uh, then, then you've um, met the, the requirement. Do we need to keep record of the $10,000 grant use since it is often received before the PPP loan is funded? Um, you know, that's a good question it, um, because the, there, were, there were no real guidelines over the use of, of the, the 10,000 is really intended to be for working capital. However, there, it's gonna be applied against the, the PPP funds. So um, my interpretation would, would, would be that, no, you don't have to document that 10,000, but understand that it's gonna be uh, applied against the, the PPP loan amount. Uh, let's see, for a portion of the loan received that is not needed, can I pay it back so as not to impact my forgiveness percentages? Well, there's no, there's no current vehicle for uh, paying that back, uh, at least uh, not, not to my knowledge. It's a good question for the, for, for the bank, but in, in terms of the the actual administration of the PPP loan from, from the SBA, um, there's not a vehicle for, for making that type of, of payback at, the, at this point. And on, until there's further guidance come out, uh, you know, I would just keep it segregated in, in, in your account. And um, at the end of the, the forgiveness period, when we know more about how that's gonna be calculated, uh, then you can make decisions on how those funds are, what you do with those funds at that point. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to let our our participants know that we are about five minutes away from a hard stop where we have to end the webinar. And we still have so many questions open that we're not going to be able to get to. We want to grab a hold of those questions that mean the most to the most people. So there is upvoting and enabled on those questions. So if you go through and read the questions um, really quick and click the thumbs up, we'll be able to uh, respond to those questions that have the most thumbs up right now. And um, that will help us answer the most uh, the, the most pertinent questions for this audience right now. So let's see, would business insurance be classified as a utility? No, unfortunately not. Could I give my employees a few free hours as a bonus? Would this payroll amount be forgiven under the PPP loan? Uh, yes, but you know, bonus amounts count. Now, you know, the SBA is gonna be looking at who those amounts are paid to. So if, if you know if you're paying yourself a, a bonus as the owner, uh, you know it's it's going to be scrutinized. But payments to um, employees, um, in terms of bonuses or commissions, are, are going are going to qualify. I mean that was, that was the intent is to um, boost the income of uh, employees who were impacted by the uh, the staff reductions. Are COVID expenses, thermometers, masks, et cetera, something that can be accounted for in the 25%? I, I don't believe so. I mean, they're, they're not utilities. And there, I haven't seen anything in the, in the um, guidelines that would indicate that they would be. Uh, let's see, I'm just now trying to get a PPP loan as a sole proprietor with two employees, scared that this is the right move as the owner, I get draws or disbursements and full-time employees, half-time bookkeeper, I pay myself my um, taxable income monthly, plus employees and boy, I'm having a hard time making out the full question. Well, Basically, I mean, trying to decide whether to apply for a loan, and it looks like he's um, questioning how to factor himself in, considering he has a half-time bookkeeper. Can I pay myself my taxable income monthly? Well, not yeah. Nothing says you, you have to apply for the the full amount that uh, the the calculation comes out to, uh, per, particularly for for self-employed. Although there there's some different rules and like I say, I, I see some new rules on, in, in terms of um, self-employment that uh, would uh, allow the, the business owner to uh, count the, the wages during the, the eight week period based on uh, wages from the, from the past year, from the, from the calculation period. So, you know, factoring in, you don't have to apply for the, the maximum amount. You can apply for a lesser amount in anticipation of, of the amount that you use. Um, plus, you have some different uh, rules for in, in terms of self-employment as to how the, uh, the amounts are spent. Okay. Can employee health benefits be covered with a PPP loan even though they are on, on unemployment? Will it be forgiven? Uh, yes. Yes, well, health benefits. Uh, uh, I mean, I, that, that's the intent was to um, maintain not only payroll, but health benefits for employees while they're off. So yes, the health benefits will, will certainly uh, count toward the um, forgiveness piece. What are the chances that businesses deemed essential and able to remain operational will have forgiveness limited? You know, that's, I don't know that, you know, there's, there's obviously there was a lot of, of press about some of the bit bigger companies that uh, uh, took the, the PPP loan amounts and, and, and now are, are backing away from it. Uh, I mean, there are certainly a, a number of businesses that uh, uh, continue to operate that no, um, that didn't see a, a decline in their business that during the, the uh, shelter in place rules and, you know, some even saw 
greater amounts of business. So for those businesses applied, I mean, it, obviously it wasn't um, the intent for these funds to be used for those businesses, but um, I don't know at, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what will happen to those. And, he, and who's to say that uh, a month from now, those businesses might be negatively impacted as well. Okay. Terry Frisk, B2B CEO, uh, CFO, excuse me, B2B CFO. Uh, this is your second go round with us for a webinar. And once again, we have gone the full hour. We're at the top of the hour. Our time has expired. Uh, we still have more questions to those that have asked questions and we haven't been able to answer. We are uh, truly sorry that we're not able to get to them. We are limited by time. Uh, I will tell you this. Terry has given us some ter terrific information. We have a number of webinars already on SBA where some of these questions have been answered. I encourage you to go back and watch those. Be watching for future webinars. We will come back to this topic in the very near future. Tomorrow's webinar that uh, starts at two o'clock mountain time is about how to reopen your business. Terry touched on that. We're going to get into specifics from a communication standpoint and uh, from a health standpoint as well and how to set your business up for success. All of this to say, be sure and watch our page uh, for the latest resources and check that SBA website that uh, will be updated. It looks like it's being updated continually with the latest on, on rule interpretations. With that, this has been a production of Better Business Bureau, Building Trust in Trying Times. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. We truly hope it has been helpful to you and your business.